Hey everybody there on YouTube, this is J.D. Yost with the Martial Arts Limited Association and I'm, I'm here with my man Sifu, Ed Stahl, we're at Metro Line of Martial Arts and we had a special event today. What's going on today, Ed? Today we had Nikolai Sanyak out for a Savat seminar. First time having him out here in North Carolina, so I was really excited about it. Um, been talking him up this whole time and it's been awesome, so. And so we had the opportunity to uh, interview uh, Nicholas and so let's go ahead and check this video out. All right, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Uh, so you just finished up the seminar. So how long have you been doing Savat? I started when I was 17. 17. Have you done any other martial arts? I have. Um, I did, um, well, I did boxing. Okay. I actually started uh, when, when I was a kid, uh, one of my cousins was training in, uh, in karate, okay. Shotokan karate. And so I got exposed to uh, that. Um, is the one who introduced me to Bruce Lee and kind of, you know, foment some interest with uh, martial arts through karate. Um, then a few years later, I had a chance to do a year of judo. Okay. And then um, I kind of, you know, put that aside until I actually found Sabat. Okay. And I started training in Sabat and I really liked it. I got into boxing, into Thai boxing, and then I had a chance to come here. Uh, and then, um, you know, when I say here, you know, it's, it's uh, California, LA. Right. Um, I had a chance to uh, meet people at the academy, uh, Innocento Academy. Okay. Uh, I had the honor and privilege to uh, teach a class. Uh, well, it wasn't a class. Uh, it was more of a fighter's training session with uh, Chad Stajowski. And from that point on, uh, I think- Like been, a training camp? Kind of, like twice a week. Okay. Um, you know, like, um, fighting training drills. Uh, so we had a ring and then, you know, people like Ron Maliki and uh, Eric Parson mm -hmm. were, you know, were in there and training and bringing people in and getting ready for fights. And so that was a really, really, really exciting time. That's awesome. So you've done other martial arts. What is it that makes you stick with Savat? Like, what is it that you really are drawn to in Savat that you stay with it? Um, I think I found you know, quickly that that was uh, something that I was comfortable with. Okay. Um, I think the range, uh, the mobility, the movement, um, the ability to learn how to, you know, strike, uh, touch and not being touched back. Mm -hmm. um, like early in my training years, uh, I was definitely afraid of everything that had to do with contact. So, you know, keeping people away with my legs was something that, you know, fit me really well. Mm -hmm. Uh, that changed a little bit and I got better when I, I actually started boxing uh, to complement my training and, and do better in competition. Um, but uh, the idea of the movement and the distance is definitely something that uh, stuck with me. Cool. Um, well, what is your uh, favorite technique in Savat? My favorite one is the revers. So it's a hook kick that I like to uh, execute sometimes uh, leaping fall. Uh, and sometimes just throwing it from uh, the ropes. Okay, and this, not everybody's gonna know, so Savat, of course, is a, is a French style of martial arts, and during the seminar, you talked about the rank being the gloves. Mm -hmm. So what is the rank order? So the rank order starts with blue. Okay. And then it goes to green, red, white, yellow. So those are the five color uh, gloves. Okay. Um, it's a technical progression that can, for beginners, I would say it takes, you know, two, two, three years of, you know, three times a week type mm -hmm. of practice, depending how dedicated people are. And then um, after that, you have uh, what we call a uh, silver glove. So the highly technical rank, uh, equivalent to, you know, black belt. Okay. Um, and we have three of those degrees. So three different degrees, and you're a second degree, second, right? Second, yeah. Second degree silver? Okay. And I know Ed said he was a white white glove, yeah, right? Yeah, white glove. Okay, so that's equivalent to like, what, like a purple belt? Maybe? Uh, yeah, something? yeah. It's actually, if you if you look at the progression, I think it's, it's exactly where it is. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned you were training at the academy, so you taught at the Inasano Academy? Yeah. For how long? 93, I think I started until 2000. Wow, okay, yeah. so about seven years then. Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a great time, great, great time. Um, then it became, I mean, like I found that I needed to um, get a more, more of a steady job, um, so I got into uh, classroom teaching, education. 
Okay. And then what, uh, what subject? Uh, elementary, so multiple subjects. Oh, okay. So I really enjoy working with kids, uh, and that doesn't, you know, that did definitely did not stop my love, you know, to teach martial arts. But uh, like I stopped teaching regularly, like on a, you know, and having like regular classes. Mm -hmm. I've been focusing on uh, teaching seminars yeah. you know, over the country and a little bit in Europe and um, through Zoom lately, of course. Yes. Um, you know, so which I found very. Um, very practical and exciting way to uh, reach people that I know I would not have been able to reach before. Yeah, I think Zoom works okay for striking art. Mm -hmm. I know I did some Zoom classes at my gym for like our karate program and stuff like that. The grappling arts, I think, are the ones that struggle the most. Like, yeah, it's it's so tricky. I mean, it's it's like I, you know, it's not something that I train in. Um, so I found it very very difficult to grab when you uh, when you're looking on TV, for mm -hmm. example. Um, it is so intricate and so. Um, subtle uh, that um, I can imagine that on Zoom it's it's difficult to grab. So you said you did Thai boxing. Have you done Taekwondo as well? No, I've never done Taekwondo. Okay. Um, I've never done Taekwondo, but um, you know when you, uh, I like kicking. So you know kicking is is like you, you you have to pick and look and and there's so much good in in so many different arts. Um, I think the biggest mistake a martial, art can, martial artist can make is to actually stay stuck with one style. I agree, yeah. Um, it's, you know, I found, um, you know, in Taekwondo, the way they leap and, and the way they execute uh, those kicks with, with the front leg is just so, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, there's a lot to take from that. No question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you were talking about fighting in the ring. Is that something you've done? You've done yeah. like competitions? Um, it's probably one of the most exciting things I've done in my yeah. life. Yeah, um, you know, you have a degree of, of uh, involvement, not just physical and technical, but uh, mental, that goes, you know, far beyond just the few rounds that you actually are in the ring. It's, it's you're talking about uh, mentally preparing yourself and, and setting goals and, you know, challenges and, and deal with the outcome and you know grow from the outcome whatever it is um, you know you come you win great uh, I always felt like I actually learned more from a loss than I did from a win, win that um, I think especially with experience the mistake that we can make is to take a win for granted uh, because you did everything right in terms of preparation and, and uh, but um, that definitely more to take from a loss. So you said the hook kick was your favorite technique. So there, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a favorite combination that you use to set it up. What would that be? Um, what works the best for you? So what works best, it depends if I do it offensively or defensively. Okay. If I do it defensively, I like to uh, come into the ropes and then uh, lean back and push off in order to reach out. Okay. Uh, with either leg, uh, left or, or right. Um, otherwise, um, offensively, I think what set it up is um, faking um, by establishing a low line kick mm -hmm. and then uh, throwing it and then uh, doubling up uh, by going uh, on top with the gotcha. low kick. Cool. <clears throat> you mentioned during the seminar, one of the things that you feel lost, like with the UFC or the MMA, is the fact that there are very little combinations. And I, I, at your level, being that you've competed and everything like that, I think that's a very accurate point. I've, I've seen the same thing. It seems like a lot of onesie twosies. Mm -hmm. what, would, what advice would you give a fighter or an upcoming fighter to, to circumvent that early? So they, they learn combinations and have the importance of them. The um, hardest thing I found, um, you know, coaching guys in, in striking arts, you know, uh, boxing and kickboxing, is that uh, it has to be something that's established early enough. So you just build confidence. Um, if um, I always found that uh, when people are too conservative, it's very hard to come out of it. Okay. So I would say just start early it's, and, and don't second guess yourself. It's, you know, you gotta fire more than one shot and, and you gotta you keep taking advantage of the opportunities that that creates uh, because it's much more difficult to deal with the combination than with a single shot. Um, it's just plain and simple. I think everybody knows that, but it's much harder to 
uh, say and do, mm -hmm. um, and and it's it's really making a abstraction of what the other person is doing. It's it's in order to perform, you have to do your best, and do your best is you have to believe in yourself. And when you start second guessing uh, yourself, then you're not performing at your best. Makes sense. Uh, where has been the where has been the seminar or the place you've taught that you've liked the most? Like what? You no, know, it's it's question? it's hard to tell. I mean, you know, of course, when you get a chance to to teach at a place like you know Santo Academy, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like the pinnacle of, of martial arts. Uh, so definitely, but I, I find the same joy going to. Uh, to a place where you know people have never done Sabbat. It's mm -hmm. it's like the seminar circuit is, is really giving me um, you know a chance to uh, reach publics that uh, really where people know very little and they're curious, and that is really what you know I found the most exciting in terms of teaching is when you have this curiosity and you just you know stop uh, uh, plugging things in and, and doing drills and you see people getting excited and you know and, and they get into it and they start sweating and then mm -hmm. you know and uh, and question arise and, and that's um, you know that's just building the way I like to teach and, and going from one situation to another one so saying that you know there's you know better place to go or a place that I prefer I, I really find the same uh, level of, of excitement like everywhere I go have you seen a fair amount of growth of Sabat in the U.S.? Or is it? I no, I I don't, I don't. Um, unfortunately, I don't. I wish I could say otherwise. <laughs> I know um, I, I Roger really Lurie is yeah. a big Sabat person, and yeah. you know he was talking about like the website and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. I'm not sure if it's the same one. It looks like it is. Yeah. And, and Roger, the work he's done with the association is great. Uh, it's just very difficult to find the support that we need to uh, function the way um, I think we could uh, to, to develop the arm and, and really have the opportunity to have more places where people can train um, because that's the key to growth. Um, but we need, I think we need more help from the International Federation. That's, that's the only way it's going, hmm. going to, uh, to happen. Um, I mean, it's been a long time since, you know, the International Federation came here <laughs> yeah. and did anything for us, you know, so um, I just find it hard. Um, and there's been periods of time where we had good competitive team as the U.S. because we had enough uh, people, you know, spreading and, and teaching the all and, and having people motivated enough to uh, compete, uh, going to Europe for... Uh, like contacts out competition doing well you know I mean getting medals uh, for which is not surprising I mean when you talk about the US you, you imagine that um, you know it's it's going to be like they do in the Olympics where they're going to have the most uh, medals mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about Saad we don't have any structure I mean we have a website we have wonderful people like Roger uh, who have been working very very hard but in terms of, of uh, developing the arm and making sure that we have established places throughout the US it's I don't really feel like it's it's happening I mean we have wonderful people that are open to uh, to Savad, um, you know, like like um, Ed here and uh, you know, Roger. That, uh, Roger and um, uh, Gino on the East Coast, the, the uh, Princeton uh, Martial Arts Academy. We have some places in California. We have a bunch of people that uh, have a chance to meet that their own school, like Ed here, um, you know, Victor. Uh, so this is great, but it's just not enough. I yeah. Mean, um, not enough to to make it grow to a point where we can have a um, you know solid federation that has enough money to send people to, yeah. to Europe to compete. Um, I mean, it's sad that you know in the U.S. like people have to pay for their own expenses to go compete. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's expensive to fly to Europe. Yeah, you know. Um, so, I mean, I can. You know, I, I can never be thankful enough for the people who have made this commitment and, and you know, put so much of their time to, uh, to represent this country and help making it grow. But it's been years since, you know, it's been like anything has been happening, unfortunately. So um, for Savat, if somebody wanted to start training in that, and of course we know there's not a lot of schools that offer it, what, mm -hmm. would, what advice would you give them? Should they look at the website and go online? Yeah. Um, like do some training online? Or do they, do you say, hey, pick a school, maybe do kickboxing and then when you have a chance to move, 
to try to find a savat school? What would you? What, yeah, what advice think, would you give them? I think that's the best idea. Um, it's you know finding a place where. Uh, they can develop kickboxing skills, and then when they have a chance, they can catch a seminar here and there. Okay. Um, you know, when uh, someone like um, you know Ed has a school, or is uh, just you know being in touch with the people who teach. So throughout the USSF uh, website, um, you know Roger is always going to uh, help people finding a place um, as close as possible. It's which is not always the case, but. You know, the one thing that I think the pandemic has, has been developing is the ability to for people to actually do some stuff online. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, I have a training program. Um, they're, they're all the people uh, would do it. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Um, so it's right. it used to be a time, I mean, Bruce Lee, you know, found uh, eight millimeters movies, you know, about Salat and, and the way to execute the psychic. So now we have tools that, yeah. <laughs> you know, are, are so easily uh, accessible that, um, you know, anybody can um, learn. I think that the, the most difficult thing is not to learn and find resources, it's to be able to train with someone. Yes. And sometimes, you know, people are completely isolated and they don't have this ability to train with uh, people. Um, so that's where, you know, I mean, I have, you know, sabbatteachable.com. Um, so it's a training website. I can, you know, I can uh, do testing as well. So it's a possibility. There's a bunch of um, YouTube pages, Facebook, um, you know, What's the website? To. So the website is called sabbatteachable.com. Sabbatteachable.com. Um, I have another website, uh, Nicolas uh, Nicolasenyaksabat.com as well with um, you know variable uh, information and then um, just keep keep researching online you know there's there's really a lot of stuff available that um, I think is fairly accessible and and not being afraid to to reach out to to me I mean you know that's there's nothing more that I want to you know help people learn um, about it or how to do it or and so I think a lot of people I know I was one of those people back in the day is they're intimidated because mm -hmm. of your level uh, or like even Guru Dan's level or yeah. Eric Paulson's level. You're like, oh, I can't ask any questions. I know several years ago they had a seminar with a Hoist, Professor Hoist Racy. Mm -hmm. They're like, you can't ask him questions. And it's like, wait a minute, what? I can't ask a question? And they're like, no, you cannot. And it was like, so oh. <laughs> certain schools, I think, perpetrate that so yeah. that I think that might be why maybe yeah, you don't get the questions because they're like oh I'm not allowed to ask you know professor uh, a question about anything yeah and it's like oh no you're saying the opposite and I know that's one of the things I've loved training with Guru Dan and Guru Ron and you and Roger and anybody else everybody's been pretty open like no ask a question that's when you're going to get the answer yeah and, and it's just so funny because other people are like the opposite so what is the core concept that you feel that people should take away from the Sabbat training? It's a great question. Um, touching without being touching return. Okay. You know, it's a striking game, right? Um, and to me, a good strike, a good combination is a combination where you come, distract, disturb, make contact, get some, you know, scoring, do some damage, and then get out safely. Bottom line. Cool. Touch without being touched. I think that's the major Sabbath concept and the one thing that I want people to understand when I teach and that's why the, you know there's so much uh, movement it's like he didn't get away yeah that's what I think I took away from today's class was uh, lots of small movements versus a couple big ones so say hey take seven small steps then you're gonna do, do, do versus taking three big steps because then you're gonna be off balance or maybe more weights on that one leg absolutely so that's what I absolutely. took away I think it's less um, uh, it's, it brings a lot more adaptability and, uh, and flexibility to, uh, to the movement. Um, and that, um, I think it's much more economic as well. So, you know, example, Lomachenko. I mean, you know, what he does in boxing is like what I dream of being able to do in kickboxing. Mm. <laughs> what you gotta get is a a UFC fighter that claims Savat and then mm -hmm. you're good like then you'll yeah. have the launch you need yeah <laughs> well you know I mean I had a chance to work with uh, Josh Barnett um, yep. and, and he was really 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 get, getting to it um, and I mean you know he had some great um, great success uh, and 
you know, I think he's at the stage of his career where um, he likes to be inside much more now than mm. he was before. Uh, but I think his footwork is what's allowing him to uh, to do that. Mm. Um, so it was wonderful to uh, to work with him, and and when I see how you know tricky his movement is, that allows him to uh, work inside with you know elbows and hands, and he's doing some you know bare hands uh, fighting right now, and and that's uh, just awesome to see that. Mm. But yeah, I agree. Um, if there was more inside guy, <laughs> you know, you could say, well, this is a lot. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, I think it's very interesting to see how the striking has uh, evolved in MMA. Uh, and when someone is bringing something new, how, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. It disrupts it, yeah. Yeah. It's like when Leona Machida did karate, no one knew what to do with it. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this uh, front snap kick to the head, it's like, well, yeah, of course we do. And so that. I mean, yeah, um, you know, when Mike Gregor got his leg, uh, his cap destroyed by low kicks, yeah, of course we do that and so that. Mm -hmm. um, and of course we need like like a trademark fighter that, you know, recognizes that, um, you know, that has some uh, training in it. And that, that would be the best, I think, promotion that uh, the sport could get. Yeah. What uh, do you find it difficult to teach Savat, being that it is a French martial art and not everybody necessarily speaks French? like? I know you said that the chasse was the sidekick. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, learning different words or having people say a different language, you find that a challenge, I guess, make it difficult? I don't, um, you know, especially having spent so much time at the academy where yeah. they teach so many different arts and, and so many different, um, you know, terminology for, uh, for, for the techniques. So I don't think it is um, to a point. So I would say that um, I think the way I teach it, I try to make it as uh, accessible as possible. So I limit uh, the French terminology to uh, the, the, the name of the kicks. Yeah, core moves. So coup de pied bas, fouetté, chassé, revers. And then everything else, uh, I plug in English terms. Yeah, you said jab, cross, hook, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I mean, to me, um, I know that that's not what the International Federation wants. But those techniques come from boxing, okay? They're yeah. not Sabbat techniques, like Sabbat <laughs> adapted boxing techniques. And they're boxing techniques, they're English terms. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then, you know, to describe a level, uh, I mean, I think it's, it makes it so much accessible to say, you know, it's a low fouetté or it's a mid fouetté or it's a high fouetté. I mean, yeah, yeah I could say, uh, you know, it's like the, the technical description for a high fouetté real leg would be, uh, you know, fouetté figure Jean-Maria. You want to try that one? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's my point of view. You know, it's a high footy back leg. There you go. Why, why make it more complicated than yeah. it is? No, that's awesome. Um, so I just, you know, keep it uh, that way. I always make the analogy and the translation to uh, the way the kicks are, you know, being called in like, you know, Thai boxing or, or regular kickboxing. I mean, you know, footy is a round kick and I'm going to call it Fouetté. Right. And Chassé is front kick, but I'm going to call it Chassé. <laughs> so what brought you from France to the U.S. then? Um, well... Because your accent is still there, so... Yeah, and <laughs> I worked really hard to <laughs> get rid of it, but um, no, it's, it's, um, it's still pretty strong, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But like, so I mean, so you worked for the me, academy in 93, right? Yeah. So um, I came to be with the woman I love. So, okay. you know, that's... Love brought yeah. you across the ocean. Yeah. There we go. So... It's a story of love. It is. <laughs> um, well, is there anything else you'd like to say for the video? Uh, anything you want to give the, the public? <laughs> Give Savat a chance. <laughs> give Savat a chance. Um, you know, experience, training. I think it's... it's um, it's whatever idea you have of what it is, you can't really get a feel until you, you, you experience you know, training in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because um, I think there's value in every all, and, and I really feel like uh, some of the training drills that we do can help any, any striking, uh, or any martial arts by, you know, uh, for that matter. Um, and um, yeah, just give it a chance. Give it a chance, put some shoes. You know, um, and yes, yeah, so you train to with your shoes on, everybody. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's very <laughs> well. I mean, it, it's 
You know, I, I do teach a lot um, in in places where people do mixed martial arts, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I completely understand that uh, there are things that uh, you know they're not um, willing to do. Uh, but I think like understanding how you can make the food work uh, is is very valuable. Um, it's you don't necessarily have this application in other competitive style. I, I get that, uh, but. You know, it's it's uh, like in terms of self defense. I mean, that's how it was developed, and and that's highly efficient for for that matter uh, as well. Oh, I know the question I forgot to ask. What is the uh, the origin of savat? The history. So history of savat. Um, it's a very old style. So it was grounded in uh, in street fighting. Okay. So most of those techniques. Um, so Charlemagne was the one who kind of put it together. I think it's like the big name to uh, to remember, and uh, and he picked some of those techniques and he put them together, found a way to describe them, uh, put them in a book, uh, which they call a treaty. And the first one was published in 1877. So wow. it's been a long, long time. Um, the technical progression was up, um, and um, and it was a sport demonstration in 1924 Olympics in Paris, and you would thought that. You know, like after this kind of exposure, he would boom. So I was. Oh, it crashed for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, went the opposite way. Somebody mentioned uh, at one of the seminars, Savat was adapted for travel on sea on boats. It's it's one of the uh, one of the theories that um, you know I read about. Um, it's there was a big school, very big school in the south uh, of France in Marseille, which is a port. So of course, if people train, you know, they travel and then they they take it um, away to other places and they bring other things back. And I think with uh, with the arm, that's uh, that's one of the things that uh, that happened and that may have you know changed and helped it mm. improve. Um, and I would say the same thing. You know, it's it's if you bring something somewhere else, then. Some things will be picked and developed into uh, into another style. Yeah. Um, so it's a very old style. Uh, and yeah, eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks very different than um, now that it did at the time, for sure. I think the competition is definitely something that has been good for it. Um, that kind of opened the minds of uh, the people, like you know, fighting with. Throwing punches and kicks is fighting with throwing mm -hmm. punches and kicks. I mean, um, I think the um, training in Savat offers a very easy adaptability to uh, other stunts. And there's a lot of very, you know, good Savat fighters that have been able to uh, to change and move to other disciplines, of, mm. you know, hands and, and feet, or just even boxing. I mean, a bunch of guys uh, uh, who... Uh, and by um, so he, he, he started uh, with Savat and then he switched to boxing and he, he had a I think WBC middleweight uh, mm -hmm. world champion so you know I mean it's a great learning school it's an amateur sport um, where top people train like pro mm. you know for the longest time they had a, um, they had a spot at the National Training Center the INSEP in Paris uh, which they actually recently, unfortunately, lost it because it's not a Olympic discipline. Uh, Got it. And but it's really well structured in France. It's definitely big in Europe, uh, but not big enough in the rest of the world. Right. And we need we need this international expansion to really get the I think the recognition that uh, that the art does deserve. Yeah. So. If you want to, you know, I think the best example of like a pure Savat product and reaching the highest level of kickboxing is um, the name that comes to mind is uh, Anissa Mexen. Okay. You know, I mean, she has like over a hundred something fights and like three really few losses and she's still at the top of the game. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And she, she grew up, she went to National Training Center and, you know, went from there and won everything in Savat before she moved to... Uh, to other kickboxing discipline and mm. she's um, she's awesome <laughs> yeah so um, I think like the, the way she uses uh, her front leg to finish a combination and close and not allowing um, you know people to come back at her is just 
fabulous and that's something that everybody should watch and, hmm. and try to pick and implement into their game okay, because yeah. that's definitely the way she uh, she has to uh, to control the, her opponent and it doesn't seem to matter who it is because <laughs> she's been beating everybody so cool I'll check her out yeah so yeah Anissa Mexen I think that's definitely uh, uh, you know name to to check out um Amri Madani was a fantastic fighter, like, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, uh, Richard Silla, uh, Sebastian Farina, um, uh, Zankifo, like those are, you know, great names. I mean, right now, yeah, I would say Anissa is the one who's still, you know, fighting and cool. who's probably the best uh, example of what, uh, what having a background in Sabat can bring to the game. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. Well, it's my that pleasure. Awesome. Uh, you know, thank you so much for having me, for coming, for being here, for training, and for being open, yeah. and for you know helping spreading out the good word about. I'm trying. <laughs> but I do my know, best, and I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So there, you guys got to see the interview with Nicholas. So you know, you make the end of the video. You know what to do. What do they do, Ed? They gotta hit the like button. Make sure they subscribe. Hit the bell so you never miss these handsome faces. All right, we'll see you guys next time. This is JD, Coach Ed, and we're out.